If you put a stethoscope over the chest, you'll usually hear something that sounds like lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, which repeats over and over again with each cardiac cycle or heartbeat. In total, our heart has four valves two atrioventricular valves between the atria and the ventricles, which are the tricuspid valve on the right side and the mitral valve on the left side, and two semilunar valves between the ventricles and the large arteries coming off of them, which are the pulmonary valve on the right side and the aortic valve on the left side. Normally, in every heartbeat, some valves open, allowing blood to pass through, and others close to hold blood within a chamber. The sound of the closing of each of these valves is projected onto the chest wall. The two normal heart sounds are S1, which is basically the tricuspid and mitral valve closing, and S2, which is the aortic and pulmonic valve closing. Between S1 and S2, we have systole, which is when ventricles are contracting and pushing blood out. And between S2 and S1 of the next heart cycle, we have diastole, which is when blood is filling the relaxed ventricles. Together, S1 and S2 form the lub-dub of the heartbeat. All right, in addition to S1 and S2, there are two other extra sounds that are sometimes heard in the cardiac cycle, called S3 and S4. S3 and S4 are heard in different parts of diastole. In early diastole, which is right after S2, the atrioventricular valves are open and blood is flowing from the atria into the ventricles. If there's a lot of blood coming in, the ventricles fill up quickly, and fluid waves bounce off of the walls of the ventricles, which makes them vibrate, creating a third heart sound, or S3. S3 sounds kind of like lub dub ta. In trained athletes and also in pregnancy, this is totally normal, and just means that the ventricles are handling extra blood volume. But an S3 can also be a sign of volume overload, like in congestive heart failure, where there's too much volume coming into the ventricles. Now, at the end of diastole, just before S1, the atria contract to get that last bit of blood into the ventricles. If the ventricles are stiff, meaning that they can't easily relax, the atria have to contract extra hard to push that blood in, creating the fourth heart sound, or S4. So S4 sounds kind of like ta-lub-dub. Oftentimes, this stiffness is because the ventricular muscles have hypertrophied, or increased in size, in order to pump against high blood pressure in the aorta or pulmonary artery. In other words, S4 is typically a sign of pressure overload, or severe hypertension. In addition to these extra heart sounds, there are also heart murmurs which are the result of turbulent or rough blood flow through the heart. Depending on how loud these murmurs are, they're graded on a scale from 1 to 6, where 1 is the slightest possible murmur, 3 is moderate, and 6 is heard without even putting the stethoscope on the chest. Now, some children whose hearts are perfectly healthy have what are called innocent heart murmurs, which are just sounds that come from the fact that their heart walls are thin and vibrate with rushing blood and disappear as a child gets older and the heart walls thicken. An example is the so-called stills murmur, which is very common among young children, and is heard best at the left lower sternal border of the heart. But other murmurs are not innocent, and can indicate a problem with the heart. Now, systolic murmurs are the ones that can be heard between S1 and S2, kind of like lub whoosh dub this is when the aortic and pulmonary valves are normally open, and the mitral and tricuspid valves are closed. There are four main causes for a systolic murmur, either from an aortic or pulmonary valve that's not able to fully open, called stenosis, or from the mitral or tricuspid valve that's not able to fully close, called regurgitation or insufficiency. In aortic and pulmonary valve stenosis, the valve resists opening up for a moment before finally snapping open, and this causes a characteristic ejection click. Because the blood has to flow through a narrow opening in that first moment, we get increased turbulence, which creates a murmur. 
The murmur initially gets louder as more blood tries to squeeze through. And then as there's less and less blood left in the ventricle that needs to go by, the murmur becomes more quiet again. This is described as a crescendo-decrescendo murmur. Aortic valve stenosis is best heard if you place a stethoscope between the second and third rib, known as the right second intercostal space, just next to the upper border of the sternum. And you can hear the murmur of pulmonary valve stenosis if you place a stethoscope in the left second intercostal space at the left upper sternal border. All right, now in tricuspid or mitral valve regurgitation, these valves aren't able to make a perfect seal, and that allows blood to leak back from the ventricles into the atria. This movement of blood can be heard as a hollow systolic murmur, because it's possible to hear blood flowing through the valve for the duration of systole. If that comes from tricuspid valve regurgitation, it's best heard between the fourth and fifth rib, next to the left lower border of the sternum whereas a mitral valve regurgitation can be heard between the 5th and 6th rib, so in the left 5th intercostal space, near the midclavicular line. Another thing that helps differentiate a tricuspid valve regurgitation from a mitral valve regurgitation murmur is the presence of Carvalho's sign. The Carvalho sign is when a tricuspid valve regurgitation murmur gets louder with inhalation, because the negative pressure in the chest brings more blood back into the right atrium and that makes the tricuspid valve regurgitation murmur even noisier. The leading cause of mitral valve regurgitation, and the most common of all valvular conditions, is mitral valve prolapse. This is when the mitral valve actually prolapses or flails back into the atrium, because the papillary muscles and connective tissue, called chordae tendinii, are too weak to keep the valve tethered. In mitral valve prolapse, there's a mid-systolic click, which is the result of the leaflet folding into the atrium and being suddenly stopped by the chordae tendinii. If mitral valve prolapse gets severe enough, it can often progress to mitral regurgitation, meaning that the leaflets won't make a perfect seal. So a little bit of blood leaks backward from the left ventricle into the left atrium. This will be heard as a late systolic murmur after the click. The mitral valve prolapse murmur is somewhat unique in that when patients squat down, the click comes later and the murmur is shorter. And when they stand or do a Valsalva maneuver, the click comes sooner and the murmur lasts longer. This is because squatting increases venous return, which fills the left ventricle with more blood, increasing left ventricular volume. A roomier left ventricle means that the mitral valve leaflets have more space to hang out. And as the ventricle contracts and gets smaller, it takes just a little longer for the leaflet to get forced into the atrium. On the other hand, standing reduces venous return, making the left ventricle a bit smaller, and that forces the leaflet out earlier in the contraction. Another cause of a systolic murmur is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and it causes the crescendo-decrescendo type of murmur. In hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, the muscle of the inner ventricular septum grows so large that it gets in the way of blood leaving the left ventricle during systole. When there's an obstructed left ventricular outflow tract, it means that blood gets forced through a tiny opening, which creates a murmur that gets louder as more blood rushes out, and then gets softer as there's less blood left in the left ventricle that needs to get by. And that results in the crescendo-decrescendo murmur best heard between the mitral valve area and the left sternal border. What makes this murmur special is that its intensity changes depending on how much the outflow tract is obstructed. If a person with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy squats or does a hand grip maneuver, systemic vascular resistance increases, and that increases afterload. When there's increased afterload, the left ventricle is under higher pressure, and it stretches out a bit and becomes less obstructed and this makes the murmur less intense. On the other hand, if that person stands up to reduce afterload, or does a Valsalva maneuver to diminish venous return and reduce preload, then the left ventricle is less stretched out, and the obstruction becomes more significant, making the murmur more intense. Another cause of a systolic murmur is a ventricular septal defect, which is when there's a gap in the wall separating the two ventricles.
During systole, some of the blood in the left ventricle, which has a higher pressure, flows over to the lower pressure right ventricle. This can be heard as a hollow systolic murmur at the lower left sternal border. Now, on the flip side, diastolic murmurs are heard between S2 and S1 of the next cycle, kind of like a lub-dub whoosh. This is when the aortic or pulmonary valves are normally closed, and the mitral and tricuspid valves are open. And there are four main causes for a diastolic murmur, either from an aortic or pulmonary valve that's regurgitant, or from a mitral or tricuspid valve that's stenotic. In aortic or pulmonary valve regurgitation, most of the blood leaks back right away from the aorta or pulmonary artery back into the left or right ventricle, and then it tapers down over time. That causes an early diastolic decrescendo murmur, meaning that it starts out loudest in the early part of the diastolic phase and then becomes more quiet over time. Now with mitral or tricuspid valve stenosis, there's typically an opening snap in the middle of diastole as blood pushes open the stenotic valve, and then a diastolic rumble as blood is forced through the smaller opening. Sometimes mitral valve stenosis can be mistaken with an Austin Flint murmur. An Austin Flint murmur is when aortic regurgitation is so severe that there's a jet of regurgitant blood that strikes the mitral valve and forces it shut prematurely. This causes a rumbling mid-diastolic murmur, best heard in the mitral valve area, but without the opening snap sound. Finally, there are continuous murmurs, which can be heard throughout systole and diastole, most commonly caused by patent ductus arteriosus. In patent ductus arteriosus, there's a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, which remains open after birth. Normal aortic, systolic, diastolic pressures are 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, and normal pulmonary artery systolic diastolic pressures are 25 over 5 millimeters of mercury. So that means that there's a pressure difference of about 95 millimeters of mercury during systole and 75 millimeters of mercury during diastole, which causes blood to flow continuously from the aorta to the pulmonary artery, creating a continuous machine-like murmur. All right, as a quick recap, apart from the two normal heart sounds, S1 and S2, two extra heart sounds might be present, S3 in the cases of volume overload, and S4 in the cases of pressure overload. There are also systolic murmurs, mainly due to aortic or pulmonary valve stenosis or mitral or tricuspid valve regurgitation and sometimes hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or ventricular septal defect. Diastolic murmurs, on the other hand, are mainly caused by aortic or pulmonary valve regurgitation, or mitral or tricuspid valve stenosis. Continuous murmurs, which are all throughout systole and diastole, might be heard in cases of patent ductus arteriosus, 